announcements. There we go, recording in progress. So we are recording. So um, I wanna welcome everybody to the session today. This is brought to you by the 5G Connected Future Incubator. I am the catalyst, Bob Siegel, for the 5G Connected Future Incubator. We work with companies using 5G for their ultra high speed or low latency, massive data volumes. This session is open to everybody, and I hope that uh, if you are not an ATDC member, this will encourage you to join ATDC. If you, either way, if you're ATDC or not, if you will tell people about the 5G Connected Future Incubator, because we can't help companies if they don't know we're here to help them. So we work with startups uh, from very early stage to uh, really establishing themselves as successful. The 5G Connected Future Incubator is sponsored by T-Mobile in the city of Peachtree Corners. We are here at Curiosity Lab in Peachtree Corners. You'll see there's a group of us here in the room. The lab is hopping today. There's a lot of people all over the place. Um, we are really uh, quite busy. It is a great place to come to. It is a great place to work out of. Uh, some quick housekeeping notices. For those of you who are involved in Prototype March, which is a program to encourage all the participants to focus heavily on prototyping during the month of March, the workshop here at Peachtree Corners at Curiosity Lab will be open on Tuesday and Wednesday next week. That's 322 and 323 um, for anyone that wants to work from here. So if you need the workshop or you just want to work here, you are invited to come on in here. Send me an email though so that I know that you want to come. I've got to make some plans, but I've got some conference rooms reserved. We've got some open tables available. Just send me an email. I will, at the end of my announcements here, be posting my email address to the chat window. Okay. And then a shout out to uh, uh, Dove Jacobson, I think he just joined. A shout out to him. He pointed out to me yesterday that I could probably be doing a little bit better job communicating with everybody on the use of the plans. Um, for those of you who are, are new, I'd ask folks uh, at the first of the Prototype March sessions to do a quick plan and send them over to me. This was a plan on what you would be doing in Prototype March. I have reviewed those. I've gotten back to anybody where there was some urgent issues. Other than that, um, what I want you to do with those plans is this week, focus on using these classes, the, the, the yesterday and this one today, to determine what your prototype will be and how you're going to execute it. And then if you have a simple prototype need, what I want you to do is to target getting it done in the next couple of weeks. So think about it. If you're an early stage startup, you probably need a fairly simple prototype. Try to get something done on that in the next couple of weeks. If you are a more advanced company uh, where you uh, need to really get, go in depth in what you're building, what I encourage you to do is to figure out your materials, your tools, the methods, the vendors, um, and I think that what we're going to get to today is going to be very helpful. And just a couple more points. I am placing some additional items in the chat window in just a moment. Those will be URLs for the videos that have occurred earlier in Prototype March. They're on, uh, they are on the ATDC YouTube site, so I'll include the ATDC YouTube site, and we'll put this video there as well. So look for those. And then finally, an introduction. So one of the great things about being at the ATDC is that if you work really hard and you achieve signature level and uh, you are the right kind of company, you might be good enough to get to work with Shane Matthews, my colleague who is sitting next to me here. Um, Shane is truly an oracle 
uh, a, a great mind within ATDC, and it is with tremendous, tremendous pleasure that uh, I get to introduce him to you today as our speaker. I'm, I'm honored to have him here, and without any further ado, I am going to let him go ahead. And uh, Shane, I'm going to go ahead and mute my speaker and then mute um, my microphone and just turn it over to you. All right. So microphone. Now we will speaker. Post the post. That's our fun effects for the day. Can right. everybody hear me? Yes. Um, awesome. Um, so now I'll put my face on so you can see me, uh, if you really want to see me. Thanks for having me. I think I know a lot of you. Uh, some of you I don't. Uh, my background, obviously, is making things. That's part of why I'm here today. And I figured that um, just kind of go through some of what I've done in the past. You'll see most all the prototypes that you see on the slide deck are actually things that I personally made. Um, We've got a long history of innovation, uh, so we're just going to talk real high levels about what are some of the different types of prototypes, uh, when you might use them, some cost around it, things like that. And then the end uh, should have some time just to take some open questions. So as I'm going through this, if there's any questions, just throw them in the chat. And then Bob's going to moderate some of the chat stuff towards the end. So I'm going to see if I can share the screen real quick. Once Bob decides to let me. Oh. <laughs> and we'll just kind of jump on in. You should be now. Got it? Yeah. Uh, I'm putting my stuff in the chat and I'll put it fine. All right, people see that? Looks like it from Bob's screen. So what I'm going to talk about today really is more of, you know, what type of prototype you need and how you get it. So here's a few just different things that I've built, kind of, kind of showcase some of the early stages from just a really rudimentary CAD model uh, to kind of start looking at it. That's the top left. The top right is actually what I would consider a breadboard or engineering model. That's the prototype um, of it. Uh, a couple other CADs and then the bottom left and right are actually the final prototype slash first design uh, for manufacturing and the CAD stuff's in the center. So really to um, get to what we want to talk about today, I wanna to try to set some common language. And what I'm gonna talk about, you're gonna hear some terms throughout this uh, this is trying to set some common language around ATDC as well, is the difference between a prototype, an MVP, and an MMP. And I'm going to talk through some of what that is and why I make the distinction between the three. So the prototype is really the first model that is primarily shows the function of the product, um, the concept around the product. You don't really care about, I don't really care about how it's made so much, it's just the function of it. Some examples are, um, these are just some examples that I've done over the years, just electrical engineering type stuff, it's just breadboards, wires everywhere. Physical stuff is made from bits and pieces of plastics and foams and just whatever you can find. And just really just to show that this thing works from a functional standpoint. The MVP is really where it starts to get into the interesting side of um, the product development cycle, which is around the design and function of it. This is where you start getting feedback from people and really starting to drive down how it's going to function for the user itself. 
And when you start looking at that, um, you're really driving down uh, top left is going to be some toy airplanes that shot off of compressed air guns. The top right, that grills were for something that charbroiler grills actually did. Believe it or not, that's actually all plastic uh, wrench shape. It functions so you can show how it actually would work, but it doesn't actually, or from a, from a aesthetic standpoint and from the way it would collapse down, but it, you can't grill anything on it, it would melt. Uh, the bottom is where we kind of start taking that first breadboard prototype where all the wiring mess and start turning it into something that people can visualize and that can actually use. And through the MVP is where I start thinking about what's the process of manufacturing as well. And then the MMP is really what um, starts kicking off prototypes that you can sell, that you can actually get people to pay money for. It doesn't mean that it's going to be manufactured with the final parts and pieces, but it's going to really more look like that. So you're going to start putting in some of the design aesthetics where people can visualize it and would actually buy it and even start thinking about, hey, this is a final product. Um, maybe, maybe it's not manufactured in the final use of materials, but it does uh, show value from a customer standpoint and shows potential revenue. And let me interrupt you for just a second, Jen. The, the items that you had in that top left corner, those are your inventions, right? Uh, yeah. Well, I'm... I did co-invent some of the Nerf Airjet dart guns. And so um, I'm one of the guys that did that. So that's where you see some of that stuff. So these are the early prototypes. These are the first functional models that we sh started showing around to actually, that we could actually start selling before we got the full license deal from Hasbro. So talk through some of the methods. Um, of prototyping and this is where you have to really start understanding some of what's available to really drive down why you should do each one so most everybody's heard of 3d printing one of the things i use quite often is off-the-shelf boxes i'll show you some examples of that in a minute uh, cnc machining laser cutting rtv molding and casting um, breadboarding from electronic side is like the Raspberry Pis, Arduinos, a lot of people have heard of that. And then there's several places that you can do rapid prototype circuit board designs. Um, that's really interesting when you start getting into the later stage stuff. So the 3D printing, I brought up a few just different examples of the 3D printing here from some of the early stage uh, super soaker gun shells to some stuff I did with clean hands, safe hands for their products, help them drive that to just some other miscellaneous little pieces that are actually more of test fixtures than the actual product, which is the top left. The CNC machining, you can do everything from just taking shape form models, which on the left-hand side is, um, is a wireless extender for cell phones is what that ended up being. So this is when they start doing the aesthetic design model. And that's actually a product called Renshape. And it's designed just for really quick model making from machining. On the left uh, top is it actually being machined. The left bottom is where uh, we kind of did the final pieces. So that way we could, before we actually make the prototypes and parts, we can start getting feedback on the way it looks aesthetically. On the right is actually a side light. And uh, that's another thing that I've helped build a bunch of stuff that floats around in space, believe it or not. But all those pieces inside are CNC machined. And we did some prototypes. Uh, we actually 3D printed some of those parts before we machined them to make sure that they would fit. And then once we validated it through the 3D printing, we went into the machining process and we did a few prototypes of the machine. This was one of the ones that it actually did go into space. Uh, RTV molding and casting is a way that you can replicate parts. And quite often, if you're doing the first few prototypes, you're going to have maybe 10, 20, 30 parts um, that you want to show around and test. So this is a great way to get a nice finished part that looks more like uh, you would buy off the shelf and 
be able to drive it forward. The Raspberry Pis, just small circuit boards. Uh, this is a package, They, depending on which kind you get, they've got little uh, pins that you can plug into. It's essentially a little microprocessor controller that can quickly deploy uh, just to prove some stuff works out. They've got a lot of open source code out already for them. A lot of different sensors that plug and play. So it's a real great place to, to just get started for the early stage. Once you kind of go from there, the rapid prototype circuits, this is where uh, you start really getting into form fit. Um, these are also prototypes. These um, or samples where they just had 10 of them made. This is just two of them that we pulled out, took a couple photos. And it's a great way to get the small package before you go to full manufacturing. Uh, it's a little bit more expensive than just buying some Raspberry Pis or something, but you can get that custom hardware that you need from it. Software stuff, you know that everybody doesn't make hardware physical products. There are tools. Um, for websites, there's some, here's just a few of them. You know, Proto.io is a great little tool just to throw some workflow kind of directions down. A lot of this is really more for starting to think about the UI UX and the way that you're gonna interface into a backend. These don't really access a database structure. There's some other ways and tools that you can use if you truly need to get database, but again, in the prototype phase, we're generally just trying to show concepts. We're not really necessarily trying to prove that it works here. And in that, uh, it's just more about the illusion that it works. It's just showing what it could possibly do. Um, so really what, what I try to express upon people, and this is really where it starts getting critical on what do you choose? And we can flip back into the previous slides at any time in the few, in a few minutes. But really, for me, you need to make sure you know why before you make anything. And the big thing with that is I see it all the time where people just go out and start making stuff. Just because you can make it doesn't mean you should make it. And what I try to steer people in the direction of is, you know, customer validation, market validation, all the financial stuff, everything around the business side, you can understand 99% of stuff before you even start to prototype anything. This is hardware as well as software. If you miss this step, if you get the step wrong, it's gonna be very expensive, especially in hardware. So the most important thing to me goes through that, truly understanding who your customer is, who the end user is, what the problem you're solving and go for the root cause of the problem, not the symptoms. And that's, to me, that's extremely important because so many people will go for a symptom and not and miss the root cause. And they wonder why it's not scaling fast. The other thing I see people make mistakes on, on a regular basis is they ask their friends uh, what they think. And most of the friends aren't going to tell you the truth when they don't like it. They'll kind of ag it on. A great true story for this is uh, I was working with a group that did essentially they it was a, a marketing group that wanted to start taking over focus groups. And so they went to uh, one of the companies I was working with, which is a Fortune 500 company, and explained to that Fortune 500 company that their focus groups were nonsense and they weren't getting any proper user data from it. So they convinced the Fortune 500 to step back, uh, think about it, run a focus group exactly how they do. The only change they asked for the Fortune 500 to do is have the product for sale on the outside of the door for all the people to purchase once they walk out the door for focus group. The second thing they wanted to, to give the focus group an extra $50, which was the estimated cost of the product that they were gonna be selling. So the, in cash, so they would have, everybody walked out of that door would have cash money, extra money that they were not anticipating. So they had the means to purchase the thing that they just saw in the focus group. Less than 10% of the people walked out of that door bought the product. Um, and so that was eye-opening for this organization 
because prior to that, they were making all their design decisions based on these focus group studies. What they realized is the focus groups are steering the direction of the people that were in them. So, so the customer discovery aspect of it, to me, is extremely important to understand how to navigate that, what to ask, how to position it. And it's really more about conversations. It's not uh, anything else. So, so really drive that home before you make anything. The other things that I want to talk about with that is, is identify why through, and these are some of the reasons why the, from conversations I have, people go, well, the investors are asking for it. Um, that's one of the big things that people say. The other questions are, are you just trying to prove the tech works? A lot of this turns into research and development. You know, it's not really validating the market or anything else. You're just developing stuff. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's actually a place for that. Uh, are you looking for the customer feedback in order to drive the design? Are you trying to sell stuff pre-sales? Or are you trying to validate the manufacturing? The DFM is designed for manufacturing for those that don't know what DFM stands for. So when you're doing the design for manufacturing, you're, you're putting everything together as if it's going to be manufactured. So when, when investors, my experience, when investors um, start asking you for a prototype and they don't talk to you about the business first and you don't talk to them about the business first, they're just kind of reacting to whatever you bring to the table. And 99% of the time when I see entrepreneurs start building things because an investor says, well, once you have a prototype, uh, come back to me, it's because investors don't say no. Um, they don't want to miss out on something in the future. And it's always a not now because they'll watch you and they'll see if you start making progress and they'll see how hard you grind it out. They'll, they'll just pay attention to what you're doing. And at some point they may jump in, but normally it's not the that they're interested in. It's actually the business. So again, if an investor starts saying, hey, do this, you need to really understand why you're doing it. Um, and if, if they've asked you for it without a real business model, then you're going to be right. Once you build whatever it is, then they're going to get into the business stuff. And then they go, okay, well, we don't see the market. Uh, or yeah, we don't invest in that kind of product. Uh, and so there, there'll be another gate that they'll have you jump through. So just be careful uh, if that's the direction you're going right off the bat. Now, you might have something very interesting to an investor, especially if it's in their space and they're interested in the technology. I've seen investors put money into something not because of anything other than they want the technology. They don't care about the business because they have another business that they could leverage your technology for. And so, so there are cases where they are just truly looking for technology uh, or the product. There's also times where I've seen investors put, I saw one put close to $10 million in a company. They were not interested in the product. They were interested in the process of manufacturing the product. So at the end of the day, the company went under because they had manufactured all these great products in the, in the, thinking that the core investor was going to be buying the products. And that core investor walked in and goes, no, we're not interested in the product. We just really wanted to know this new process that you guys developed to make those things because we have some other products that we think that process will work on. And that company did not do any intellectual property protection on the processes, so they lost out on the entire thing. So just be careful. That's a short of that. Um, the Prove Your Idea Works. This was, if you remember the very first slide where I showed you the CAD stuff. When uh, I started working on, this is some of the very first steerable sewer inspection equipment. And I was brought to this group uh, by a friend of mine uh, because they've been trying to solve a problem for a while and they were just kind of stalled out and they were looking for new innovation and some other things. So as an innovator, I jumped in and said, hey, I've got some ideas. You know, I could build some robots. And so I took their whole company in a totally different direction. They had no idea what direction I was going to take it in. Again, I went to them. I started interviewing them and finding out what the problems were. And what I came up with was uh, this chassis. On the uh, front and rear axles, there's a magnetic disconnect clutch. 
And then in the center, you have the left and right drive systems. And if you look closely, you can see how they, the left drive system or left drive motor actually drives the right side and vice versa. So as I'm talking to them, the big challenges for them in the at the time, nothing existed when you do sewer inspection. Uh, you drop a, they would drop a, what they call a crawler inside a manhole. So it had to fit through a manhole. So that's one criteria. Once it went in the manhole, it was tethered because um, all the power consumptions, the video feeds and all the things they were trying to get out. And plus if something happened to it, they could pull it back out with a cable. But once it got in the manhole, it just, it just went uh, straight line. And if it got, kick sideways or if there's a curve in the pipe it would roll over it flip upside down they'd have to drive it backwards uh, and they had no control over it so this was one of the very first um, crawlers that had full steerable controls that would fit through a manhole cover the other thing that we haven't really touched on i know a lot of people start asking kind of what's the cost of these kind of things this particular project was a $250,000 project for the company. And this was in the mid nineties. So today's money was probably about a three fifty dollars $400,000 project. And that included all the research ahead of time, the discovery, understanding the problem, building this chassis and, uh, and really getting it to just pass this part with all the electronics it took to drive the control systems uh, for the camera fees and integrate into the system. If you had all the means to do it yourself, that's what, that's what I charged the group. That's not what it actually cost me. If you look at the materials in this, I had all the skill sets, I had the machines. It was about $3,000 in materials, just over um, for this particular chassis. So most all of that was the cost of development. And that was with us handing over a lot of the intellectual property type stuff to them. The, the price is gonna vary depending on what you get. They had four other companies that had worked on the same project uh, prior to engaging with us. And they didn't get anywhere. They didn't get anywhere past where they initially was because there's no true innovation. So this was all about proving that our concept would work for them to get to the next level. The next thing is, you know, just kind of feedback. I put this up there. Okay, this doesn't really have anything other than design aesthetics. This was actually a partnership with a glass blower. I did all the metal work. He did all the glass work. We kind of did the design uh, collectively together. The idea was he was going to start selling these things as uh, signature series. And I don't know that he ever really got much past it because he didn't really validate the market before he got into it heavy. Uh, I just thought it was a fun, cool project. And when he really, he had a couple people that said that they would buy them. And then when he started to produce them, nobody actually brought the money to the table. So what he realized was that uh, the cost to make these things was so high for what the return was, nobody really wanted it. So a one-off as an art piece, yeah, he could sell that. But to go into production for this particular piece, it didn't work. We ended up, I don't have a photo of what ended up being designed, but he ended up changing the design. Uh, so it had a similar style, but instead of all the hand-blown glass, it was off the shelf glass globes. It didn't quite have that funky hand-blown look. Um, the curve was not as, as pronounced. And some of the, the top details, instead of the rods going through the center where we had to do square cut holes and fab it up, uh, they just went to the edge. So there's there's some pretty drastic design element changes, but it cut the cost of goods tremendously. And even at that, he didn't hit what he had projected because once again, the market just didn't want to pay for that style. So it's a good way to uh, start getting the, the feedback of will people pay, will they not pay? Um, do they like it? Do they not like it? Uh, so that's that's really there. So the, to get to these level prototypes, if I, if I go back to that um, level, a lot of that would be some of these type of prototypes um, here. Uh, that grill up in the top right, 
that was a half million dollar project for Charboro. The stuff up in the top left, uh, we did that, you know, did that, and that was, if I was going to put a number on that, I think that was about two hundred thousand to get to that level, um, and that includes you know the prototypes. There's a multitude of prototypes to get to that. Uh, that was kind of the all-in cost. Now, if you have designs and you just want people to do that, and you just want them to prototype that, you just took the designs to somebody, it would be far less. But these are uh, more of what it really costs for the designers to do the designs, the engineers to do some of the, the prototyping, the multiple iterations to get to that stage with the technology. That was all new technology. The bottom, the circuit board, that's probably about $15,000 for the engineering and get the boards right. Um, the bottom right, uh, there's a little house housing down there. Um, I can't remember what he ended up paying for that. I think that was about 30 grand all in for the board design, uh, the battery layout and the little housing to get to that point. So, um, so that's really kind of where you start getting there. The, the next stage really is to start looking at truly selling it versus getting feedback. So once you really understand what the feedback is, um, you start driving it down. I put this up here because this, this gives you the next level of the steerable crawler um, of the projects. You can see the camera heads on top. Uh, we designed all that. You saw the CAD in the very beginning of the slides for that. If you look at the wheels, you can kind of envision that chassis with the, you don't really see the motor sticking out uh, from that when they, they stick inside the wheels. The reason the wheels stick out a little bit further is because it gives the clearance for those motors. All the chassis designed out of uh, brass and stainless steel, which are low spark, no spark uh, units. And this was the first prototypes for production. So these are not production models. These are actually the very first ones that we made that were gonna be product produced. And I think this, to get them to this stage, the company had spent right at $2 million. Um, again, they were contracting everything out. Uh, if you're doing this in house, you can save money because a lot of that's labor cost. Uh, the, the materials themselves are not cheap. You know, the motor drive trains are not cheap. We have a question that I want to interrupt you for. Is yeah. this a rendering or is that actual hardware? That's actual hardware. The, the, none of these are rendered. The only, the only rendering in this whole slide deck was the CAD. There's not a single rendered image other than that. So these are actual images. Actually, if you go, I could probably go to, um, I mean, I can look it up in a second. Uh, we can go to Cobra Technologies and I'll find it just a minute. Let's see if it's still up there. Cause I, I'll, that's curious to see if they're still producing these and what it looks like. Um, so I'll do that in just a minute. The, was there something else, Bob? No, that was the main one. Everything else will we'll catch uh, okay. afterwards in the um, question session, but that one. So the design from manufacturing validation, kind of going back to, um, depends on what your part is. If you're doing some of the, like a circuit breaker, if you're going to do any validation from that, especially if you're trying to go through certification processes, you're going to have to use end use materials, meaning the certain nylon reinforced plastics, uh, resins, things like that, that are spark proof. There's only one way to do that, which is actually to injection mold them. So, so what would you do when you're trying to make sure that it works? Well, a lot of times, instead of cutting the mold out of steel, you'll do it out of aluminum. Another reason, and this is an aluminum tool for some parts. Another reason you use aluminum uh, is for shorter runs where and it, because of the cost, aluminum tooling is a fraction of the cost of steel tooling. It's just so much faster to machine and polish out. Uh, you can still get tens of thousands of parts out of it, but you're not going to get hundreds of thousands of parts. So if you don't know what you don't know, this is a great way to start figuring it out. And, and depending on the parts, you know, something like this, the tooling, the aluminum tool for something like this is anywhere from $1,500 to five grand, depending on what the market is. And then really not counting the engineering. This is just for the tool. You know, the engineering can still be for something like this, you can still be 10, $15,000. Um, 
taken away any of the research and development side on the front. And again, the numbers I gave for some of the previous projects, a lot of that was the research and development side of it, as well as everything that start to finish to the, where you saw the, the parts. Um, something like this, you could for you know, 15 to 20 grand start to finish. If you had a simple part like this, you could have a tool made and to pop out 500 of these things. Do you have any aluminum tool, tooling company? This is really where the rubber hits the road. It all depends on your skill set and your network. Um, and the network is everything from who do you know that has a machine shop? Who do you know that's an engineer? Uh, who do you know that has contacts with an engineering firm? You know, it just all those kind of things. Uh, who do you know that's marketing? And if you don't know any of those people or those type of people, then it's important to get out and meet those people and develop relationships with them. Uh, if you do know those people, then you have a leg up over a lot of other people in the world that have ideas. I tell everybody all the time, ideas are worthless, execution is everything. Uh, it's not about the idea. I mean, if, you, if you're waiting for an idea, I've got tons and you're welcome to all of them. Um, and if it's something I'm working on and if you can out execute me, then you deserve to have it. Uh, if I'm working on something actively, that doesn't mean I'm going to go promote it out before I'm ready. But if somebody catches wind or anything else and I'm out executed, I'm not mad about it. And it's happened uh, more than once. Uh, so understanding what it takes to get to the final design of where you want to be and the evolution of design is important. Uh, you normally don't jump straight into the DFM validation. You're going to go through all the all the steps prior. You're going to prototype it out to make sure it's going to work. You're going to get a little bit further to make sure people really like it. And you quite often you'll do two or three of those versions, depending on what your product really is and how close you are from your customer discovery. If you've got great customer discovery, then sometimes you nail it the very first time. Um, and and as far as the job shops to do all the different parts and pieces, I've got a deep Rolodex, so it's an unfair advantage for something I'm working on, but that's part of why I'm with ATDCs to help give you guys that unfair advantage uh, when you're working on something. And I'm happy to try to get together with people. Uh, I run a moderated product circle the second Tuesday of every month. Uh, it's a great place just to jump in, ask questions. It's really more about building community uh, amongst yourselves versus me telling everybody what to do and how to do it. There's a lot of resources right here we try to pull together. Um, there's a lot of the resources that are out there that I don't even know or leverage because I've gotten spoiled and it's kind of stuck with my own group because I've got a team that executes fast and well. So I haven't really gone out outside of that. But there's, uh, there's a difference between in a quick, easy, and cheap. Um, so quick and easy is usually not cheap. Cheap is usually not quick and easy. And sometimes ne neither of them are good. Um, so you can ask for typically one or two of the three type of things and get them. Um, my suggestions is try to stay domestic through all of this process. When you start using overseas prototyping sources, although they may be cheaper, uh, you run the risk of losing some of your intellectual property. Uh, you also have an opportunity cost, which can be very high, uh, especially nowadays with all the logistics problems we've been having. And it doesn't, to me, it doesn't make sense from a human standpoint. When you start manufacturing in low volumes, I still try to do it domestically. The reason for that, when you start looking at overseas sources, unless you have a great relationship with a really a broker, and I do leverage overseas resources, but I always do it through a broker because a broker is somebody in the US that I could sue if I need to, and they know that. Um, and, and they respect that. 
and they're the ones who do the translations. They're the ones that are up in the middle of the night, making sure everything's on point and driving the design. And they're that middleman, and there's some value to that middleman. The biggest thing with trying to do short runs overseas is when you start adding your time for the quality control aspect, it really, if your time has value, which mine does, it really shifts the way that the business model looks. Now, if you don't put your labor costs and your time down, of course, it looks a lot better uh, for per part, but it only takes one time to mess something up. And I've got tons of examples of where people have gone overseas. And then when they get the part, it's not where they thought it was. I mean, there's one, I was working with a, a guy that had a golf product. The manufacturer overseas sent him the prototypes. Um, they look good. They functioned. Uh, so he said, all right, well, send me some samples and let's go ahead and manufacture it. So they started manufacturing it and they pulled out some samples and sent him so he could validate for quality control. They showed up, everything looked good. So he said, ship it. They shipped him 5,000 units and all 5,000 units had to be unpacked, uh, recrimped. There was a, a little chain mechanism in there. They had to recrimp all 5,000 units by hand, repackage them and send them out. The ones that the prototype, the first dozen that he sent, I think they sent him 50. All 50 that they sent him were great. They all worked perfect. They didn't have to do anything to them. So being at the factory, he would have been able to catch that before it left the factory. If it was domestic, he could have put him back on the pallet, sent it back to the factory and said, hey, fix this. This isn't what we discussed. This, this isn't what I signed off on. He ended up um, eating a, basically what he spent in labor. He ended up about two times what it would have cost if he would have just had him produced domestically. Um, the next production run, he thought he had it right. They made a different mistake the second production run. The third production run, he brought it domestic um, because he was only doing small runs so he didn't have anybody on the ground over there that could check them. And when he started by the third time, he realized that he was going to have to go to the factory before they put him on the container to send him back. And when you start calculating the cost of the flight for 5,000 units at a time, it just didn't make sense. Now, using a broker and some other people, depending on what you're doing, it may or may, make, may, or may not make sense. Um, you know, it's a judgment call. It's a, it really is depending on what the product is, uh, how complex it is, how much labor is involved. Um, and there's some cases it's the opposite where the overseas manufacturers have such a specialty, they put it together and send it and, and they can do it so fast and cheap. Uh, it's easy. These, um, these boards, if I remember right, these came from China. Uh, so we sent the designs over there and they sent them back and they, and there, it was a seven day lead time from the time they got the files before they had them in the, at the office. Uh, if it wasn't these boards, it was some similar to this. Um, so. Should we take some questions? Yeah. So um, any suggested companies for RTV molding? So there's, uh, let's do this. There's, um, I think Pally Proto is doing it. There's a guy that's in South Atlanta and Peachtree City that I've used. Greg Olden is his name. I uh, can't think of his company. Right now it's like 3D something. Uh, he was doing product development stuff primarily until the movie industry came in. And now he's primarily doing uh, props and things for the movie industry because it's a lot more lucrative, but the skill sets are very similar. The parts come very similar and he still does do product development for the local shops and people. Okay, and that's Olden, O-L-D-E-N? That yeah, Gary okay. Olden. Um, and I can look up his contact information. All right, and then um, we've got a question here. Um, are the total project budgets 250K, 2 million, et cetera, the chain quotes inclusive of testing um, things like focus groups, usability tests, or just the design and fabrication of the prototype? 
So some of them include all of it. Um, obviously, when you're getting up to that 2 million mark, usually that's going to have, depending on the complexity of the product, uh, that's going to have some of that research in there to make sure that you're de designing, developing a product that actually matches the needs. Um, the lower end, a lot of times the design houses are just going off of exactly what you're telling them. So you, you'll get some quotes for twenty dollars to $50,000 to do some of the work. But if you describe to them something that either doesn't make sense, they're going to make, they're going to design whatever it is, whether it makes sense or not. They're not going to think about it. They're just going off of whatever you, your proposal is. So that's where it's important to really understand yourself and to save money. The more you can do, and the more you can leverage, uh, the better off you are. And I may have asked you this already. If, if I did, uh, we'll just skip over. Do you have any aluminum tooling company suggestions? So again, there's, um, I rely on the manufacturer. So TransPower is one of the uh, manufacturers I use quite often. East West Manufacturing is another one that's here local um, that's really good about talking and helping and East West actually has some design engineering services um, where they can help do some of that final design for tooling. When it comes to tooling, there's some, there's some voodoo magic artwork that goes into the mold flow stuff that these tooling manufacturers understand. Uh, the draft angles and all that are important. Having a good engineering firm that understands that to begin with um, and understands how to manage that relationship with whoever's making the tooling is important to get your final part right. But yeah, the nine times out of 10, I just rely on them. Uh, in the past, I've had independent people make the tooling. And what I found is if I have an independent group make the tooling and hand it to a manufacturer, it's always the fault of the other person why something doesn't work. How difficult would it be to source your tool in China and have it shipped to a manufacturer in Mexico? And is this common or uncommon? It is common. Um, and it's more common to have it shipped to a manufacturer in the US because tooling in Mexico is not, you're not going to save a crazy amount of money. You can actually have tooling in Mexico made for not much difference than what it's going to cost to make it and ship it from China especially when you, you have to fine tune it once you get the mold. But the, the cost of a tool and having it manufactured in China and shipped to the US can be up to half the price of having it made domestically. Um, recommended sources for low production tooling, short run molds locally, RTV, aluminum, or in the U.S. or Mexico? So there's a couple groups out there. Um, one of them, they just changed their name. I can't remember the new name. Uh, it's like Fast Proto. Uh, what I can do is some of these, I, I'll put in a addendum to the slide and I can send the slides out to everyone with some of the sources for some of these. Um, so uh, this is a question, are there 3D printers available on site at 5G Curiosity Lab or ATDC Midtown? And what are the soft, uh, software file requirements or overall processes? Um, we do have three, um, we have three 3D printers here. I don't know what the software file requirements are, but I will get uh, that information. It is, I can send you the um, types. Um, do we have, we, we do have them also at uh, Midtown though. Yeah, so most all the 3D printers are gonna uh, use an STL file type, uh, it's .STL. And, and so that's gonna be the file type that they're gonna bring in. And the 3D printers, they're gonna have what they call a slicer. And that's gonna take the, the file and make it into whatever thickness level that the printer prints in because most printers are additive manufacturing, it adds one layer at a time. And based on the printer, each printer is gonna have its own thickness and speeds and all that stuff. 
Um, and that's kind of the nuance that you're going to have. The ones at ATDC, we have a professional grade uh, that you can do tooling models. And right now it's down, uh, it stays down more than it stays up. Um, if it's not used, it's very expensive to use. So what we've, unless there's several companies using it consistently, it's actually less expensive to just outsource it. The FDM printers, which are both here at Curiosity Lab and uh, at ATDC, they do great prints. Um, you can actually buy the, depending on how much you're printing, what your needs are. There's a lot of maker spaces around that have the same level 3D printers, the same quality 3D printers. And a lot of the maker spaces can help you with slicing your file and printing. Uh, Roswell Fire Labs, for those that are close to here, they're off Hocum Bridge Road. I think it's like 100 bucks a month to join. And they've got 10 or 12 3D printers uh, right there. And they have a couple different kinds and they teach classes on 3D printing and they actually will help you print your stuff. They also have laser cutters, um, little metal fab shop area. So that's a great place, great resource if you're gonna to try to make some of the stuff yourself. Pally Proto is where I actually send most of my stuff. They're over in Kennesaw. They have a lot of professional grade 3D printers. So if you're looking for higher resolution, difference in materials, uh, somebody that might be able to tweak your file, uh, if you just look them up, it's P-A-L-I Proto. Um, in Kennesaw. They're a great group and it's actually less expensive than trying to own the printers yourself. And if you're going to do a lot of printing, you can pick up a 3D printer from anywhere from $500 to about $2,500 that, that really does a great job. The ones we have at ATDC, the FDM printers, I think they're $500 a piece. Um, and when we looked at the resolution and quality, the $3,000 printers, you can tell a difference between the parts. Um, so the, some of the software interfaces are a little bit nicer. Huh. So I think that's all of the questions that were in the chat window. So let's open it up. If anybody wants to unmute themselves and ask a question or if any guys in the room. Um, so yeah, here's just for you, everybody to laugh at. Um, my email's on the bottom. This was me in my early 20s as an inventor entrepreneur. Uh, this is one of the first prototypes of the, one of the Nerf uh, dart guns. This one ended up not getting to market, but the technology inside is actually a core part of what launched the Nerf air jet line at the time. You can barely see the difference. Yes, yeah, right. Uh, my beard's a little more gray now, but I'm still shaggy and don't think about what I look like on a daily basis. There's some of us that would like to be shaggy. Any questions from the uh, from uh, the uh, uh, Zoom world? So let me ask you a question. Um, you, you talked about what the, the circuits that you showed right after the um, Arduino and the, um, uh, uh, th those, right. Those right there. You had those built specifically for a project and you had them done in China. Did I get that right? Yeah. So actually I'm looking at these. I think looking back at this, I think those might be the circuits that went into this device, and in which case those were actually made in the U.S. Um, because all the satellite stuff is all U.S.-based technology. They try not to do anything overseas with anything that's going to go up in a satellite. Um, but this one that you see here was, uh, was one of the first prototypes. And in, if we zoom in, um, you can actually, well, I can't zoom in easy right now. The screen's not letting me do any of that. But if you look at that circuit board, uh, you can see there's no components on it. It's just a board. And so what we did was actually the boards came from China and we just sent them a file. They sent the blank boards. And then the, the guys at the company, this was clean hands, safe hands. They actually populated the board in-house. 
in at ATDC, we have a reflow of it. So the way that works is you have a solder mask, a little, and you put a soldering paste on all those little silver tabs. And then you put the components on it with a set of tweezers and you put it in this oven and it melts everything, all the solder and everything just kind of falls into place. It's the same basic process as a production. It's, a, it's done by robots in production at a very high rate. Um, Is that kind of that's that was it? Yes, fascinating. All right, any other questions, folks? Okay, and, and on this slide, I'll just say this is the off the shelf boxes. Again, you can see on the bottom right, it's just the boxes you buy. On the, on, on the left, you can see that was just a CNC machine that drilled the holes in it, uh, the oval in it. The one on the side is round, the one up top, same thing as that one had a CNC machine that just put the hole in it and then uh, put it crimp fixture in it so quick so, and easy so folks um, first of all shane thank you very much that was fantastic um i will be posting this video on youtube very soon uh it will probably be uh tomorrow in the afternoon but i'll be sending out the link as well and i put the atdc youtube page into the chat window along with a couple of the previous ones uh, a final shout out to uh, or, or add commercial if you will for the 5g connected future incubator and for atdc um, we hope you will take a look at joining us uh, we can't help companies that don't know about us so please spread the word that we're here, we're ATDC, we're part of Georgia Tech. The 5G Connected Future Incubator is a part of ATDC, sponsored by T-Mobile and Peachtree Corners. That's a great group. The best 5G available in the United States. A really cool lab. So I hope we'll see you out here. Thank you all. And- uh, uh, I am not recording myself. So if